and ideal linear polarizer, it can produce linearly polarized light from an unpolarized light, right? Now, if we have two ideal polarizers uh, and if their transmission uh, uh, axis is perpendicular to each other, meaning that we have cross polarizers, then what happens is that the light would be eliminated. There will be no transmission. So um, that brings us to actually Malus's law. Now, this is a, a, a diagram that shows unpolarized light coming in from here. And this is the first, uh, there's a pair of polarizer, but we call the first one the polarizer, uh, whereby we will produce a linearly polarized light. Uh, in this case, we have made the transmission axis vertical. So we have this linearly polarized light as it enters the second polarizer, which we call the analyzer because its work function is to analyze what would be uh, the uh, plane of polarization because when you turn the analyzer to 90 degrees, whereby the transmission axis is 90 degrees to the polarizer, then no light will emerge. So at angles which are not 90 degrees, then the transmitted uh, uh, light will have a uh, irradiance or intensity that is given by Malus's law and that is related to a cosine squared function whereby the angle theta will be for example this is a transmission axis okay this is transmission axis of first polarizer if the transmission axis of second polarizer is at a certain angle which is over here theta so that's the theta we are talking about. And I prime zero will be the maximum irradiance when both of their transmission axes are aligned. Now here, uh, we try to derive Marlouz's law by considering the um, electric field. Now, when we have unpolarized light beam coming in, we then visualize it as uh, the same uh, possibility of a vibration of plane in uh, randomly in many planes. But once it let it pass through a linear polarizer, whereby, for example, in this case, we set the transmission axis at theta angle from the vertical. Okay, so we have E01 that will be transmitted. So this is this E01 will then be polarized. This will be the amplitude of the polarized light. Then this uh, linearly polarized light uh, with reference to the second polarizer, which is the analyzer, whereby the transmission axis is vertical. So this vertical axis is actually at angle theta with TA1. So for that, we can actually resolve this component into one that is parallel to the second polarizer and perpendicular to the second polarizer. So the one that's parallel is E01 cosine theta. And E01 sine theta, which is the number two uh, uh, component will not be able to pass through. So only uh, E01 cosine theta will pass through and that will be E02 that we are getting here. Okay, so this explains that. And uh, when we talk about irradiance of uh, a beam, then it is related to the electric field amplitude squared multiplied by half C epsilon zero. Now C is the speed of light in a vacuum. We take that to be in air and epsilon zero is the permittivity of free space. So the irradiance that reaches the detector that's after the analyzer, which is the second polarizer, would then be half C epsilon zero multiplied by the amplitude squared, which is E01 cosine theta squared. And maximum irradiance we know will occur when theta is equal to zero and both of them are aligned. So substituting that in, it will give us half C epsilon zero E zero one squared, which happens to be the intensity of that polarized beam. Okay, e, uh, I one here. And in fact, I one uh, would actually be half of the irradiance of the unpolarized light that was uh, uh, incident onto the first uh, polarizer. So Malus's law therefore can be written as I2 will be I now equals to maximum irradiance. Okay, because this will represent maximum irradiance, I prime zero and cos squared.
theta and the variation of the intensity will look this way as you adjust the angle uh, relative angle between the two polarizer uh, transmission axis so this when they are aligned so you get maximum transmission this when they are crossed uh, it darkens its extinction this is a demonstration of Malus's law the background is the lit white screen of my laptop of which the light is linearly polarized the screen actually uh, has a polarizer sheet so I bring a pair of clip-on Polaroid sunglasses as you can see the words uh, can't be seen now this is because uh, the transmission axis of the sunglass is perpendicular to the plane of the polarized light from the screen so we can take the sunglass to act as an analyzer while the screen acts as the polarizer as I rotate the sunglasses by 90 degrees we see through it the words stay home stay safe as you can see over there the transmission axis of the sunglass analyzer and the screen polarizer are now parallel rotating another 90 degrees they are cut off again and rotating another 90 degrees the words are visible and rotating a full 360 degrees well we go back to the uh, original starting point and we have the crossed polarizer and analyzer pair now uh just now i told you that uh the irradiance of the linearly polarized light is half of that of the irradiance of the unpolarized light so let's look at this now compare let's compare that now for unpolarized light we had this simplistic representation whereby it can be represented by two orthogonal vibrations of equal amplitude so we represent as ey ex and they have equal amplitude now each of these vibrations would then contribute irradiance of half c epsilon zero e zero squared so the total irradiance of this unpolarized uh, light then we can write as the sum of the two of them which turns out to be uh, c epsilon zero e zero squared so therefore comparing this to this you will you will see that the irradiance of the individual component will then be half of the irradiance of the total. So a, a linear polarizer not only pol produces linear polarization, but it will also reduce the irradiance of the original unpolarized light by half. Talking about my loops, I would like to introduce to you uh, this is a landmark in Paris, the Eiffel Tower. Now, at, at this level, his name is actually inscribed here. Very special. Malus, it was a French physicist. Now, here actually are the uh, uh, different side of uh, those panel, whereby Malus' name is on the northeast side, and then you from the other side, southeast, southwest, northwest side you will recognize some of these famous names which I've underlined and see if you can find more, okay? So if you ever have a chance to go to Paris, don't forget to look up these panels at the Eiffel Tower. Now, let's go into production of polarized light. Um, when a material has uh, optical properties that are asymmetrical, along the direction transverse to the propagation vector then uh, when they interact with light they will polarize the light so the keyword they must be some uh, they must respond asymmetrically yeah in different direction uh, we are going to name four processes uh, these are the most important ones that can produce polarized light uh, dichroism the selective absorption uh, reflection from dielectric surfaces so light reflected from dielectric surfaces that can be linearly polarized and uh, you can also get polarized through scattering and uh, there's also what we call as a birefringence uh, this is the material having two refractive indices there's also another mechanism uh, or process that modifies the state of polarization it is not going to produce but it modifies and that's 
optical activity. And this one also uh, involves bioreflinges, but it involves circular bioreflinges, meaning that the material will have refractive index for right-handed polarization and then uh, refractive index for left-handed polarization. Uh, so one useful application for bioreflinges is uh, photoelasticity. Now let's start with dichroism. Uh, as uh, I put it just now, dichroism produces light because it's able to selectively absorb one of the resolved E vibration component of an incident uh, unpolarized light, while it allows the orthogonal component to be transmitted. So there are many types of dichroic polarizer. Uh, examples are the wire grid polarizer. Uh, there are Polaroid sheets, uh, which are the, the sunglasses that was showing you on uh, Malus's law. And there are also naturally occurring dichroic crystals. So let's start with the wire grid polarizer. This one is useful in the IR range that would be from 1 mm to 1 meter wavelength. So let's look at this unpolarized light. Uh, so we represent it. Uh, as uh, two orthogonal, resolve to two orthogonal vertical and horizontal component. Now, and when you pass through the wire grid, then it is the horizontal component, which is perpendicular to the uh, alignment of those wires that will be able to pass through. Uh, while the other component, the vertical component, will be absorbed by the uh, wire. How does that work? So, Let's look at how the vertical component of the E-field can be absorbed. This vertical component of the E-field will then drive the ele conduction electrons in these wires because these wires are metal. So it drives them into oscillatory motion. This oscillating uh, electron then will uh, make up that dipole uh, oscillator source. So it will be able to radiate EM energy so it re-radiates in all direction except the direction of the uh, oscillation itself, which is in the direction uh, that's up and down. You don't have uh, uh, radiation, but you have radiation all in the uh, plane. That is this plane here. And um, so, and then you still have that incident beam that's coming. So the vertical uh, E-field this vertical E field of the incident field will then uh, interfere with the re-radiated field. It results in cancellation because the re-radiated wa radiated wave you will, will, will have 180 degrees phase out, uh, out of phase, will be out of phase with the incident waves there. So they cancel each other out. And that that's why uh, you find that that component cannot emerge from it. Now, in addition to the um, uh, where the uh, oscillation of free electrons, if they are not entirely free, so the effective friction due to interaction with uh, maybe lattice imperfection, then that will also result in some energy being dissipated, and hence the incident wave also will get. Uh, uh, attenuated. Uh, the main cause why this vertical component is not uh, uh, transmitted is basically because of the cancellation uh, of the re-radiated wave with the incident forward direction wave. Yeah. Now, what about the horizontal component? Uh, the horizontal will be the transverse to the length of the wire, so there's rather little room for it to oscillate, for the free electron to oscillate. So this become a weak oscillator, so the re-radiated EM wave will be reduced in strength, and therefore it will have very little cancellation with the incident wave. Hence, it is the incident wave is able to pass through. So it would be wrong to think that the E-field component that's parallel to the wire uh, will be able to pass through because it can slip through the spaces between the wires. So that is a wrong concept. Now, um, besides the wire, we have this, what we call Polaroid sheets. Now, Polaroid, the first uh, dichroic sheet polarizer was invented by this Edwin Herbert Land in 1928, and he was only a 19-year-old undergraduate at Harvard College. So he's about your age or maybe younger. 
and he's so brilliant. So he incorporated a synthetic dichroic substance, which is called herapathite, or it's chemically, it's called quinine sulfate per iodide. So these crystals were grinded into millions of very fine submicroscopic crystals and their needles shaped. Then they try to align, you must align all of them so that they're nearly parallel to each other, uh, which can be done by magnetic or electric field, or he mechanically aligned them by making a viscous colloidal suspension of these needles and pushing it through a long narrow slit. So by doing that, then they form, they create a sheet, which is called the J sheet, the first one, a large flat dichroic crystal, a sheet. And, uh, but unfortunately, this one is not of very good quality because, um, those uh, grinded uh, uh, needle-shaped crystals, submicroscopic sizes are still large and they scattered light and the J-sheet is a bit hazy, so it's not that clear. Then the improved version of this is H-sheet and uh, this is the most widely used linear polarizer. Now uh, here it is something like the grid, uh, wire grid that was shown to you, except that the wires now is made up of molecules. So how do how the how is it fabricated? A clear a sheet of clear polyvinyl alcohol is heated up and stretched in a given direction. So the long hydrocarbon molecules will be aligned in that process. Then the sheet is deep into the ink uh, solution, which is rich in iodine. So iodine will penetrate into the plastic and attach to the straight long chain of polymeric molecules. So they form a long chain of its own, yeah? So this long chain is similar to the wire that we are thinking, uh, that, that we described earlier on in the wire grid polarizer. So how does this one work then? Uh, it's quite similar, but except that the electrons acting as dipole oscillator in this material, which is non-metallic, they are not free. So the wave generated is not out of phase with the incident uh, wave in other words there would be very limited cancellation so in that case then we ask the question how is it able to polarize light but uh, but you see when the incident driving wave advances through the polarized sheet its energy will gradually dissipate so thicker polarized sheet will result in more absorption because uh, that's given by this uh, equation uh, whereby the, the, the transmitted irradiance would be equal to what was the incident multiplied by the exponential function of negative uh, alpha is absorption coefficient and this will be the distance that it penetrates. So you'll find that the further it penetrates, the less intensity you will get. So the orthogonal component of the Fe field that is perpendicular to the molecular uh, long chain will be transmitted okay uh, so this is an improved version of the earlier polaroid sheet in this case um, there is a very little scattering problem because instead of rounded fine needles is now of molecular dimension so this is the third example. Now this example will deal with uh, naturally occurring uh, uh, dichroic crystals. Uh, when we say dichroic, uh, this has to do with colors. Di means two, two colors. Uh, afterwards, you'll understand why. Why do we have selective absorption? Because there's an inherent uh, anisotropy in the crystalline structure. It has a uh, optic axis, for example, look at this. It has an optic axis in this direction uh, that's determined by the crystal's uh, atomic configuration. Now, uh, the E field component of the incident wave where we have resolved into a vertical and horizontal uh, uh, component from the unpolarized beam. Uh, so the component which is perpendicular that's this component to the optic axis is actually strongly absorbed by the crystal. So the thicker the crystals, the more absorption until uh, it is sufficiently absorbed such that whatever that emerge will just be the vertically linearly polarized light. So this E field would be parallel to the optic axis. Uh, 
this is the one that would be transmitted. So one of these natural occurring crystal is the tumuline. And uh, these crystals are comparatively small and, um, and uh, there are some um, absorption uh, which is wavelength dependent in this crystal. That's why uh, you see that it comes in different colors. Like over here, uh, when you hold these uh, uh, tumuline crystals to uh, white light, it will appear uh, different color depending on what direction you look at. For example, for the green specimen, now these ridges here will correspond to the optic axis. So when you are looking transverse to that you will see it coming up as appearing as green but if you were to look in the direction which is parallel to the optic axis they'll turn out to be black yeah so when we say dichroid that's why we had that two colors that's why we call them dichroid uh, material now we'll go to a, the uh, second um, process that produces a linearly polarized light, which is due to reflection from a dielectric surface. Now, um, light can be specularly reflected from dielectric surface, right? Uh, when we say specularly means that uh, you, uh, it is not the uh, diffuse light. You can see the, for example, the windscreen you can see the, the reflected image of the, the sky, the clouds in the sky, uh, the windscreen of a car. So light from the sky is specularly reflected. And uh, this reflected light can be um, linearly polarized. If not totally, it can be at least partially polarized here. Yeah. So how did that happen? We like to know our cause. Now let's, uh, consider a narrow beam that's incident at an arbitrary angle on a smooth, flat dielectric surface. Of course, if the surface is rough, then it'll become a diffuse uh, reflection. Um, and we can actually represent uh, the unpolarized beam in uh, two resolved orthogonal E-field components. One which is perpendicular to the plane of incidence. Now, the plane of incidence in this diagram is the plane of the screen. That's the plane that, that have the uh, incident beam, the reflected beam, as well as the transmitted beam, and also where uh, the normal is. So uh, ES field is the one that's perpendicular. So we call it the transverse electric mode, that's TE mode. Now, here is a dot to represent that it's the field, uh, the electric field is aligned in and out of the screen. And then we also have uh, the other orthogonal component, which is along the plane. So this is um, the P polarized direction. So here, though, the E field is parallel to the plane of incidence, but the magnetic field will be transverse. So we have transverse magnetic mode. So TE mode is here and TM mode is here. So let's first consider the TE mode alone, just this. Now, the action of this electric field vector of the light on the electrons on the surface of the dielectric, is uh, it, what it does is it will stimulate the oscillation along the same direction. That means it's in and out of the page. And uh, radiation from all this, so this electron uh, uh, induced to oscillate. So this electron forms the dipole oscillators. So they will start to re radiate out. So the radiation from this uh, electronic dipole oscillators will then all add up to form the two beams. Uh, the direction of the beams are dictated by Snell's law. So you have the reflected beam and the refracted, the transmitted beam. And both of them also would be uh, linearly polarized because we just consider one linearly polarized incident beam now. Uh, that's, they will also be polarized in a TE mode. Since both the rays are in a direction uh, perpendicular, the rays, uh, no, the dipole axis is in and out of the page, but the direction of the ray is along the page. So they are perpendicular uh, to the dipole axis. So they all have correspond to maximum dipole radiation. So both these rays will be 
radiated. So now let's consider the other component, the orthogonal component, that's the TM mode, which is represented by EP here. So in this case, the electric field vector is along the plane of the incidence. The incident ray, when it arrives at the uh, dielectric surface, it gets reflected and transmitted. Then the direction in which the reflected ray uh, travels is in a direction given by the law of reflection. And the, and the transmitted ray travels is according to Snell's law. Now, uh, what happens is that the um, uh, EP here then will act on the electrons uh, in this material here, and it will then stimulate dipole oscillation. It displaces the electron from its position, and then there's a restoring force that pulls it back and it starts to oscillate. So you create the dipole, uh, and this dipole oscillation will be along a direction that will be perpendicular to the transmitted ray. And the direction of transmitted ray is uh, dictated by Snell's law. Because this dipole is oscillating this way, the E field then will be perpendicular to this direction, as you can see over here. Now, let's consider this direction of this dipole moment, which is in this direction. We can uh, resolve it into a component that is uh, parallel to the reflected ray and perpendicular to the reflected ray, because we want to consider uh, the contribution of EP to the reflected ray. So the component which is along the direction of the reflected ray will not contribute to the reflected ray at all because it is parallel to its directions. Whereas the one that is perpendicular would be able to radiate. Uh, so this reflected ray will only have uh, this part of it, this part. Then the dipole oscillator in a sense radiate, uh, actually radiate very weakly along directions which are at small angles with the dipole axis. So only a fraction of the EP component of the original light now would appear in the reflected bit. That component is only that resolved component which is perpendicular to the direction of the reflected ray. Now what we have done TE and TM mode. Now we superpose the two of them. What's going to happen? Let's see. Here is the TM mode where the incident angle is not equal to the polarizing angle because when it's equal to polarizing angle, the scenario is different. Uh, and uh, now I superpose on it the ES, which is the T mode. As you can see, uh, this is the incident beam with a uh, refracted or transmitted beam and the reflected. The reflected beam then is actually partially polarized with the TE mode being more dominant because the, the TM mode uh, is low, which is uh, given in this statement here. Now let's consider the special case whereby the incident uh, angle is equal to the polarizing angle. And what do we mean by that? The polarizing angle is at an angle whereby the reflected ray makes an angle, makes a 90 degree angle with the transmitted ray. And we only consider the TM mode. So what happens here is that uh, the dipoles oscillate in this direction, which is perpendicular to the transmitted ray. But this reflected ray is 90 degrees to the uh, transmitted ray. So in other words, this reflected ray will not have any TM component now because this dipole oscillation, the axis of this dipole is in the direction of the reflected ray. So there's no TM component at all. In that case, uh, when we superpose the two uh, TE and TM mode together, then you find that the reflected ray now composed only of the TE mode. Now the reflected ray is totally linearly polarized with TE mode, but the angle has to be equal to the polarizing angle. Then we ask the question, what would the value of this angle be? All right, then we'll go into what we call Brewster angle. So we'll do some derivation here. Uh, this polarizing angle is called Brewster angle. And uh, with 
this being 90 degree, then we are going to apply Snell's law. That is N1 sine theta P will be equals to N2 sine theta T. But we have this relation, right? So this angle will be 90 minus theta T. And this is 90 degrees, so this angle will be theta T. So which means theta P plus theta T is equal to 90, or theta T is equal to 90 minus theta P. So in that case, then, now our theta T now can be substituted with 90 minus theta P, right? So sine theta T will equal to sine 90 minus theta P, and that, this, this one, is actually equal to the cosine of theta p. So now then we replace sine theta t with cos theta p. So cos bring it over here, then you have sine theta p over cos theta p that gives you tangent theta p. And n2 here bring n1 to the right side of the equal sign and we have a ratio of n2 over n1. So this is called Brewster law. And that's how you can also find the uh, Brewster angle. Um, but the intensity of the reflected beam is actually quite low because uh, only 15%, especially for uh, air and glass interface, only 15% of the ES component is reflected. How do we increase this intensity of the reflected beam? One way is to do stepwise intensification meaning we pile up a number of plates. So every, at, we pile them up. So at every surface, we will have 15%, 15% of the incident beam onto that layer. So in other words, whatever is reflected out in the air, we have an integrated reflected beam, which would be of higher intensity. One of the use of booster angle, it becomes a perfect window for TM polarized light. What we mean by that? Now, when we have a TM mode coming at polarizing angle, it get transmitted through, no reflection at all, transmitted through with theta R, and it is still in TM mode here. And of course, this angle, this is a block which is parallel surface, so this will also be theta R. And According to Snell's law, when it exit, the angle of exit will be theta p, and we have just the tm mode. No losses here because we have no reflected ray. So the tm linearly polarized beam is again fully transmitted through this uh, material, this dielectric material. Uh, it is also used in a laser system, uh, whereby the end of this uh, tube that uh, uh, confine the uh, gain medium, and um, they are cut, uh, angled at Brewster angle, such that the TM polarized mode will be the one that's transmitted, and after repeated uh, reflection, you have a laser output here. Light will pass to and fro between the resonator cavity by the rear mirror and the output window. This is partially transmitting. So each transit through the tube, the TM mode will be completely transmitted. Okay, they are completely transmitted, whereas the TE mode is partially reflected and at this surface it will be reflected out of the alignment of this uh, resonating cavity. For one round trip of cavity, the TE mode will experience more loss than the TM mode. And after repeated losses, it will be very low and you'll find that the output laser beam will only have the TM mode. Now let's look at sunglasses. Uh, of course, this sunglass must be a uh, Polaroid, this must be linear polarizer. So these are Polaroid sunglasses. Now they transmit only the vertically polarized light. So when you look directly uh, the ray from around, so unpolarized light that enters, so you get uh, a reduced reduction in intensity because only the vertically polarized light can pass through. You can get about slightly more than half the intensity if this polarizer uh, ideal 
polarizer um, because the unpolarized light can come in many directions because uh, it's an extended space here. Now consider the beam that is reflected from dielectric surface. So it would be partially polarized with TE mode because the TM mode will not be reflected or will be minimally reflected. In the, this diagram, it is drawn this way. So this one will be meeting a polarizer where the transmission axis is vertical. So it will, the glare, this is what we call the glare will be greatly reduced, the reflected light from the surface, we call it the glare, will be greatly reduced. Perhaps you have heard that wearing a pair of sunglasses during heavy rain, it will help you to see better. Now, because the rain will scatter light in all directions. So by putting on a pair of sunglasses, you can cut off the scattering. Okay, that is um, similar to this case. And of course, your sunglasses has to be polarized sunglasses, and then you'll be able to see through better. So the reflected light from those rain drops will then be cut off. Now here is a demonstration of the reflected sunlight from uh, my car wind screen here. This to demonstrate the um, using a pair of clip-on Polaroid sunglasses. So I'm going to do demo. Okay. So here I bring that pair of clip-on sunglasses here. So I'm bringing it near to my camera lens, and you see that the reflected sky on the wind screen has disappeared. But as I rotate it to the other direction, you can still see the clouds. But then as I turn it back to, uh, because the transmission axis of my sunglass is vertical, so the reflected glare is cut off. But when I tilt it, uh, when, I, when I rotate it the other way, then it becomes aligned. The transmission axis is aligned with the uh, polarization of the reflected light, so we can see it. Okay, then we finish this lecture and uh, after going through this lecture, you should be able to apply Malou's law to determine intensity of the output beam uh, even with uh, after going through a series of linear polarizer. And you should be able to explain uh, how polarized light can be produced through trichorism. And you should also be able to explain how polarized light, linearly polarized light can be obtained through reflection. Uh, from a dielectric surface, and you should be able to derive Brewster law and describe some applications of these linear polarizers. Thank you.